Chem 2212 and its synthesis. So today we're going to be combining an unknown amine, and our unknown code here is ER139, with acetic anhydride in the presence of our aluminum oxide catalyst. We've already weighed out the appropriate amount of our catalyst. We're going to combine it into our reaction vessel, which is a 50 ml Erlenmeyer flask. I'll measure out my amine, add that in, and then proceed with the reaction. I'll set these two aside for a moment, and let's measure out our amine. The amine has a very pungent smell, a very strong odor, so we're going to be measuring this out very carefully underneath our snorkel. There we go, there is our one mil of our mean. So first step is going to be adding our aluminum oxide. Carefully bend my way paper here. Tap our paper so that our powder will fall into the flask. And there we go. I'm going to gather that to one side of the flask. Then I'm going to pour in my one mil of my unknown amine. All right. We formed a slurry of our catalyst and our amine. Set that down. Then I'm going to slowly add my one mil of acetic anhydride. This also has a very pungent smell to it. So we're going to be very careful. I'm going to hold, let's move some of this out of the way. We're going to be doing this drop wise because this is a very exothermic reaction. I'll hold my Erlenmeyer flask at an angle. And add about one drop every three seconds. And I'm going to swirl each time I add a drop. And you can see right, our vapor that's forming in there. So we've got to be very careful with this. Again, we're doing this under the snorkel to make sure that none of these fumes get out of our flask, and if they do, they're safely evacuated. flask is warming up in my hand as I add this acetic anhydride and I'm sure you can hear the popping sounds as the reaction proceeds. Swirl this just a little bit without adding for a couple of seconds here, just to make sure we're getting a good mix. A 
right at my pinky here at the base of our flask, which is where the majority of our reaction is located. It's very warm to the touch. Just gonna let it swirl a little bit before collecting it back down in the corner. Trying to make sure we get an even distribution of all of our reagents here. Got the last remaining bits of our acetic anhydride. And that should be the last drop. And we've got a tiny bit more. Of our acetic anhydride. I'm going to swirl this flask for the next 10 minutes to make sure that our reaction goes to completion. And we'll check back in for the extraction process. So while our reaction is swirling for 10 minutes, let's do a recap on our data sheet. We have our unknown code ER139. We have our volume of uh, both of our amine and our acetic anhydride, which is one mil apiece, 0.152 grams of our aluminum oxide. Popping and hissing when our acetic acid was added to the reaction mixture, so that was something that we observed. We also saw the evolution of white smoke or fumes that were formed as a result of our acetic acid, uh, or sorry, our acetic anhydride being added dropwise. And then our reaction vessel became very warm during the addition of our acetic anhydride. So all observations made during the course, the initial course of our reaction here. Once we're finished swirling, we'll come back and start our extraction process. Our reaction has finished swirling. It's been about 10 minutes. We're gonna go ahead and start our extraction process here. Set this down briefly. We're gonna take 
10 milliliters of ethyl acetate and pour that into our 50 mil Erlenmeyer. swirl this around try and get as much of our aluminum oxide if you can see the aluminum oxide is stuck to the sides of our flask give that a good swirl let it sit for a second while we set up our gravity filtration so we're going to do a gravity filtration but we're not going to do it in an Erlenmeyer we're actually going to do it over top of our 400 mil beaker so I'm going to fold my filter paper. This is a fluting of our filter paper. Fold it into quarters. Then we take one of our flaps to make this nice cone shape. Take our short stem funnel, place that cone into the funnel, and set it down. That's our hot plate that has been warming up. I'm going to hold this with my finger for the initial filtration here. We'll swirl this and we'll pour our mixture through. So what we want is our amide product to dissolve into our ethyl acetate to flow through our filter paper and into our beaker and we want to capture all of our solid catalyst, our aluminum oxide, in our gravity filtration. I'm going to set this on its side briefly and let it continue to flow. In the meantime, I'm going to take another five mils of our ethyl acetate, second wash, and pour that into our reaction flask. This is just making sure that we get all of our product out of our flask. I'm going to push this a little bit closer to our snorkel. I'll lift up our filtration setup and pour through the second five mils, or the second extraction, which is five mils. Set aside our reaction flask and let this drain through completely. This can take a little while. Once it's finished draining through our gravity filtration setup, we'll come back to get everything set up for the hot plate. Our gravity filtration is finished. As you can see, we've captured all of our aluminum oxide on our filter paper here. So we're gonna set that aside. So we have our ethyl acetate with our product in our beaker. We're gonna set that on top of our hot plate. I'm going to move my snorkel so that it's directly on top. As of right now, we're going to be driving off our ethyl acetate to isolate our product as a solid. We're going to let this go for roughly 20 minutes or so. We'll give a specific recording of the time once it's finished. We've set our hot plate to 110 degrees as per the instructions in our procedure, and we'll check back in on it as it starts to evaporate. So we finished evaporating off our ethyl acetate and now we place the beaker on the bench top and as you can see, our crystals are starting to form in the bottom of the beaker. As this approaches room temperature and gets a little bit cooler, that crystal formation will intensify. It's in fact happening right in front of our eyes. Once it's finalized, we'll crush this into a powder using our glass rod. So we'll leave it here for a few minutes to cool down, come back, and turn it into a powder so that we can dry it further in the oven and then get our IR and NMR measurements. So we've let our product cool in the beaker. I'm going to tilt it up so we can get a good look at how beautiful these crystals are. We're going to break these up using our glass stirring rod. 
they're still a little bit wet. Let me get a good angle so you can see that. So we still have a little bit of ethyl acetate in our beaker. So once we break these up sufficiently, there we go. we're going to put them into the oven so that they can continue to dry completely before we weigh them to get our final product weight. Try and get as much off of the spatula tip as I can. Okay. So we'll place this beaker. This is pre-weighed. So we're going to place this into our uh, drying oven, drive off any remaining ethyl acetate, and come back and weigh our final product. We've set the oven to about 85 degrees, which is above the boiling point of our ethyl acetate. Let's give it five to 10 minutes. We'll come back and check and see how the crystals are doing. So we've let our product dry in the beaker inside of our drying oven for about 10 minutes. We're gonna go ahead and get it out. We've got some nice crystals that have formed. I'll tilt it up like that so we can see. We're gonna break these crystals up, make sure everything's dry. We'll do a WAF test. I don't smell any ethyl acetate, so we're pretty sure that we removed all of our solvent. We'll weigh this and find out how much product we actually ended up collecting. These crystals are nice, nice and dry once I scrape them out here. I'll let you see what they look like. They were a little bit wet before. They were sticking to our uh, glass stirring rod, but now we can see that they're nice and feathery crystals that are dry. So let's go ahead and weigh this. We've already weighed our beaker. So we'll weigh them in the beaker here to determine what our final weight is. I'm gonna tear the scale. Gonna give us an error code here, of course. There we go. So 140.851. So this is our beaker plus our product is 140, we'll check back on it here as we're looking, 140.848. Changed a little bit as we were talking there. So we've got our final weight of our beaker and our product. Now let's take our crystals over to the IR and we're gonna characterize it using IR, then we're gonna take it over to the proton NMR and get a spectrum. Before we head over to our IR and NMR to characterize our final product, let's take one last look at our data sheet. We just weighed out our beaker plus our product at 140.848 grams. We subtract out the weight of our beaker. That leaves us with 0.676 grams of recovered unknown amide product. The appearance of our final product were feather-like white crystals. Let's go take a look at what our IR and our NMR spectra will tell us about its identity. So we brought our crystals over to the IR here. I'm going to take, I've already run a background. We've already saved that to the system. So now we're going to take just a few of the crystals. And all we have to do is just cover our diamond cell here. I'll go ahead and Put our press down. That'll hold our crystals in place. We've already got our sample set up here. We're just calling it 2212 amide synthesis. We'll hit OK. Our sample is ready to go. Then we're collecting. OK. We'll add this to our window. I'm going to go ahead and find peaks here. Let's tell, 
and our peaks. That looks like a good set there. So now we've got all of our peaks up above 3,000 or right at 3,000 marked. We've also got our peaks down below here. We've got a 1638 and a 1500-ish peak. Let's hit replace. We've got our values. We'll go ahead and post this up on ELC so that you can go through and identify the important peaks related to your AMID product. We'll save this as a TIFF. Oops. Save it to the desktop and we're all set. Alright, so now we'll move on to the Pico spin to get our Proton NMR. So we just got done characterizing our product with the IR. Now we've come over to our Pico spin here. So I'm going to set this aside for just a second. First things first, we have to push our DI water out of our loop. That's always our first order of business. Screw the inlet down, push out our water, it's good to go. Now we need to prepare our sample. So I've got our Eppendorf tube here. We're going to fill this about halfway with our sample crystals. Then we'll dilute it in chloroform D, deuterated chloroform. This is something that we've used before, but the idea behind this is that we've got a solvent system that will not have a peak that shows up in the proton NMR, which means the only peaks we have to worry about are the peaks related to our compound. So let me go ahead and get a little bit of these crystals here. this up in our holder here for a second. And that should be more than enough. I'm going to tap it down a little bit. That should be more than enough to give us a good spectra here. So I'll set this in the holder. Take our deuterated core form. Just a little dropper bottle. And I'm going to fill the tube just about one dropper full here. Set this back down. Close up my tube and shake. just to make sure that everything's nice and dissolved. And as far as I can tell, I don't see any of our solid still present in that tube. Final step for preparing our sample is to add in a little bit of TMS. This is our tetramethyl silane. This is our standard. I'm gonna use my micropipette here. couple of drops. Go ahead and cap that up and then we're ready to go. I'll give it one last mix before we inject. Okay, so everything's dissolved. Looks pretty good. New syringe, new needle. We want to make sure that we don't cross-contaminate with our DI water or anything else. Go ahead and draw up pretty much our entire Eppendorf there, just as we've done before. We've got an air bubble. Turn it upside down. I'll go ahead and push that up. 
right? Because we don't want to have any error in our loop. We just want our sample solution. I'll open up my inlet, carefully insert my needle, close it down, and then we're looking for 10 drops coming out of our outlet tube here. All right, and that's more than 10 drops. So we're all set. That just tells us that our loop is filled with our sample solution and we're ready to start our run. We're set for eight scans. We've named it Chem 2212 Amid Synthesis. I'll go ahead and click Go. And we'll see what our spectra looks like. Okay. Now remember, each successful pass will clear up the noise that you see in the baseline here. So we're going to change our phasing. Our phasing is going to clear up and the noise is going to resolve itself. That's why we do eight scans. It's a refinement over the course of multiple scans. Okay, we're about halfway done at this point. There, our phasing came into line. Almost done. Seven of eight scans finished. And there we go. So we've got a little, we're a little bit off phase, but we're going to clean that up in our MNOVA software. Let's go ahead and zoom in so we can get a sense of what our spectra looks like. So we're going to take this spectra, we're going to put it into MNOVA, we're going to go through and assign, we see our TMS here. We've got a pretty significant TMS peak, so quite a lot, comparatively speaking. Um, we'll go through and uh, integrate each one of these peaks. Once we get this set to zero, then our delta values will come in line. We'll post it up on ELC for you to go through and identify all of the important peaks for characterizing your unknown product. Good luck with your lab reports.